Writing of the Epiphany, that great incorrupt Benedictine, Blessed Dom Columbia Marmion, states, quote, The fathers of the Church have seen in the call of the Magi to Christ's cradle the vocation of pagan nations to the faith. As soon as the Word incarnate appeared here below, he invited the Gentile world to his cradle in the person of the Magi. He, eternal wisdom, would thus show us that he brought peace, peace to men of good will, not only to those who are nigh to him, the faithful Jews represented by the shepherds, but also to those who are far off, the pagans represented by the Magi. The calling of the Magi and their sanctification signifies the vocation of the Gentiles to the faith and to salvation. God sends an angel to the shepherds, for the children and people are accustomed to the apparition of the celestial spirits. To the Magi who study the stars, he caused a marvelous star to appear. The star is a symbol of the inward illumination that enlightens souls in order to call them to God. Close quote, Blessed Dom Marmion. So the very foundation of the mystery of the Epiphany is the call of the pagan nations to the one true faith, as seen in the call of the Magi to Christ's cradle. And there are a number of significant blessings done for the Feast of the Epiphany, the blessings of Epiphany water and the blessing of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. One interesting fact is that these blessings also contain prayers to drive away the devils. In fact, during the blessing of the Epiphany water, there's a very serious exorcism. Why would Epiphany, the twelfth day of Christmas, have specific blessings that are so concerned with the demonic? That should be pretty easy for us to see we consider that we're celebrating the calling of the pagan nations to Christ. After all, before the coming of Christ, all the nations of the world, every last one of them, excepting, of course, the Hebrew nation, was in bondage to the devils. As Psalm 95, verse 5 states, all the gods of the Gentiles are devils. All the gods of the Gentiles are devils. So in this feast, the feast which reminds us that Christ didn't come just for Jews alone, but for all the tribes of the world, all of them, in spite of the fact that they were locked into varying degrees of demonic darkness, that he came to free us all from sin and darkness, it's only fitting that the blessings associated with this feast contain prayers to drive away the devils. And you don't need me to point out to you that in our day and age these blessings are more needed than perhaps any time since our ancestors converted. Our society is drowning in an absolute flood of occult and pagan practices. Superstition is everywhere. It's everywhere. So today let's take a little closer look at the sin of superstition. St. Thomas tells us that, quote, superstition is a vice contrary to the virtue of religion, and it consists in offering divine worship either to whom it ought not be offered or in a manner it ought not be offered. Close quote. Superstition is the sin of offering divine worship either to whom it ought not be offered or in a manner it ought not be offered. We've already covered the question of offering divine worship to the true God in an undue manner when we consider the sin of Catholics participating in Seder meals. St. Thomas discusses this particular category of sin in question 103 of the first part of the Summa. In regards to other types of superstitious practice, we'll run down three categories used by moral theologians. The three categories are idolatry, divination, and vain observance. As we'll see, the sins from the various categories can easily blend together. Number one, idolatry. Idolatry means giving divine honors to any creature. Divine honors would be like things like worship, offering, sacrifice, and so forth. We'll read from a commentary on idolatry found in a book published in 1957. Quote, In missionary countries, it is found that the primitive, uneducated pagan worships stones, trees, animals, and many inanimate and irrational things. It is questionable whether they always worship the thing itself. Image worship is animistic in its lower form and symbolic in its higher. The concrete object is viewed as infeasibly permeated or animated by the presence of a spirit of which it is the dwelling place. The educated pagans adopt a symbolic explanation, that is, that the symbol is a, the image is a symbol of some attribute of the deity. Close quote. 
Okay, obviously what was once true in 1957, not so very long ago, what was once true of pagan missionary countries is now true virtually everywhere in our beloved country. Neo-paganism, earth worship, Wicca, voodoo, brujeria, santeria, and even blatant Satanism. You name it, we got it. Their Force Academy has built a stone circle so that the pagan cadets and staff can worship there. There are pagan chaplains that serve our troops in our military, as well as prisoners incarcerated in our prison systems. Let's not have any illusions. Barring divine intervention, this is here to stay. That's the reality. The America that you older folks remember is gone. It's gone, and we're now the counterculture. For all intents and purposes, culturally speaking, this is a pagan nation with a few tattered vestiges of Christian culture. And all the elections in the world aren't going to change that because we lost the cultural war. This is a pagan nation. Idolatry is just going to become more and more blatant as time passes. So the first category of sins of superstition and idolatry, giving divine honors to any creature. Second, divination. From another moral manual. The sin of divination is committed when the devil is invoked either explicitly or implicitly in order to discover secret or hidden knowledge. The sin of divination is committed when the devil is invoked either explicitly or implicitly in order to discover what is secret and hidden. There's explicit invocation of the devil when his aid is expressly implored. For example, the devil sometimes takes possession of the body of a human being and manifests what is secret through it. This was called Pythonism. You can read about the slave girl with the Pythonic spirit in Acts 16. But nowadays, we call this channeling. Another example is when at certain places the devil gave oracles through idols. Now this was common in ancient times, and I fully expect we'll be seeing plenty of this in the near future. So one kind of divination occurs when the devil is explicitly invoked, as in the case of channeling, or oracles pronounced by idols. The devil is implicitly invoked when means which are not naturally sufficient for the purpose, and which have not been ordained by God for that purpose, are used to find out hidden things. For example, the devil is implicitly invoked in palm reading, when the lines of the hand are consulted as indications of the future, or when some chance event is taken as foretelling what is going to happen, as in omens. Other examples of divination with an implicit invoking of the devil are quite common. A few examples are scrying. Scrying is looking at a crystal ball or a mirror to tell the future, or reading tarot cards, or having seances. A seance is sometimes called necromancy because the object is summoned in the spirits of the dead. But if a seance is actually successful, instead of speaking with the spirits of the dead, the people are actually communicating with devils. And devils can be unbelievably convincing here. Or perhaps the most pra common practice in our society of the implicit invocation of a devil is using a Ouija board. Now, all these practices are grievously sinful as such, not to mention dangerous. The actual case of possession on which the movie The Exorcist was based came about as a result of playing with a Ouija board. So the second category of sins of superstition is divination, invoking the devil either explicitly or implicitly in order to discover secret and hidden knowledge. Channelers, psychics, palm reading, tarot card reading, horoscopes are everywhere. Ouija boards are even sold in toy stores. Three, vain observance. As we just seen, divination used disproportionate means to discover what is secret or hidden by the help of the devil. Vain observance also used disproportionate means, but to obtain certain or astounding effects by the help of the devil. It is important to note, as in the case of divination, that the practitioners are not necessarily aware of the devil's aid. In fact, they may very well not even believe in the devil. So vain observance is the use of charms, spells, sorcery, and cabalistic signs to preserve persons and things from harm, or to cause harm to persons or things, or to cure wounds and diseases, or to acquire knowledge without study. Perhaps the larger category of sins of vain observance could be called witchcraft or magic or sorcery, but vain observance also refers to the superstition observance of various things and behaviors which are considered lucky or unlucky. A lucky horn, lucky rabbit feet, not walking under the ladder, Friday the 13th, or in, or in cow country, not throwing your hat on a bed. Morally speaking, there's no difference between divination and witchcraft. 
like divination, witchcraft may contain an explicit or implicit compact with the devil. If there is an explicit pact with the devil, even if it is under the guise of some pagan god or goddess, there will always be mortal sin. And besides all that, this is extremely dangerous, and not only to the practitioners. In an absolutely huge percentage of the cases treated by exorcists, witchcraft or sorcery of some sort has been involved. And many times the victim has no clue how the, how the predicament came about or that he's been the victim of a spell. It is only after the exorcist forced the devil in the name of God to reveal the open door by which he entered that this comes out. And to answer the question that many of you are thinking, yes, sorcerers can cast spells which harm other people, this should not be that amazing. Everybody knows that if someone really wants to hurt someone and doesn't want to do himself, it is possible for him to enter into a business deal with a certain kind of evil person, like a hitman or sicario, and contract for that evil person to harm the third party, right? Everyone has heard of putting a contract out on someone. The situation is basically the same. Devils are the most evil kind of persons, far, far more evil than a hitman or sicario. And it's possible for sorcerers to contact devils in order that they hurt a third person. We call that putting a curse on someone or putting a hex on someone or casting a spell on someone. This has always been commonplace in some parts of the world, in some cultures, but now it's becoming commonplace here as well. Stay in the state of grace. Say your rosary. Wear your blonde scapular. And always, always bless your food before you eat. And you don't have anything to worry about. Besides staying in the state of grace, blessing your food before you eat or made, making a little cross over your drink is an essential habit to get into because probably the most common way of putting a curse on someone is by placing a cursed item in the food or drink of the intended victim. But if you bless your food or drink, spiritually seeking, speak, spiritually speaking, you will disarm the spell. Okay, so the third category of sins and superstition is vain observance. Invoking the devil either explicitly or implicitly in order to obtain certain effects or marvels from the devil. This stuff is everywhere as well. Witchcraft, sorcery, curses, so-called love charms. They don't work. At best, it only affects lust. Potions, brujeria, voodoo, santeria, candles to be burnt to Santa Morte, amulets, crystals, certain types of holistic medicine. Let's not have any illusions here either. Barring divine intervention, this is here to stay. We live in a pagan nation. Now, these are all First Commandment issues. There's a lot more that could be said, but this is only a sermon on superstition, not a course on the occult. Okay, so what have we seen? We've seen that superstition is a sin of offering divine worship, either to whom it ought not be offered, or in a manner it ought not be offered. We've taken a quick look at three categories of superstitious worship. We've seen that the first category of sins of superstition is idolatry, which means giving divine honors to any creature. We've seen that the second category of sins of superstition is divination, which means invoking a devil either explicitly or implicitly in order to discover secret and hidden knowledge. And we've seen that the third category of sins of superstition is vain observance, which means invoking a devil either explicitly or implicitly in order to obtain certain effects or marvels from the devil. Okay, so today we're celebrating the fact, except for those of us who are of Hebrew blood, we're celebrating the fact that our ancestors were called from the deadly darkness of divination, witchcraft, and pagan idolatry, and given the priceless gift of the true faith, the faith without which it is impossible to please God. And yet, even as we celebrate this fact, all around us, our friends and neighbors and relatives, all around are turning back and entering back into bondage to the very devils that our ancestors were freed from. The mystery that God has shown each of us in giving us the true faith is a very great mystery in the best of times. In this cultural chaos and apostasy, let us show our gratitude by carefully preserving it. Now before we close, there are two specific dangers that many, many people who are striving to be good Catholics need to be warned about. And these will only be warnings. We simply don't have time today to develop these two topics. The first warning pertains to certain practices imported from the East, which by their very nature produce mental states, altered states of consciousness, which are characterized by a significant reduction of logical thought and accompanied by a passivity of the will. These practices by their very nature produce altered states of conscience, 
Mental states which are characterized by significant, significant reduction of logical thought and accompanied by passivity of the will. It has nothing to do with Christian prayer and meditation. And practices that produce altered states of consciousness can open doors to demonic influence. Parenthetically, so-called recreational drugs also produce and stimulate altered states of consciousness, which can open doors to demonic influence. It is not for nothing that in the book of the Apocalypse, the word for witchcraft or sorcery can also be translated drug use. I don't think you need me to warn anyone who's interested in going to heaven about the moral implications of so-called recreational drug use. Okay, so a few examples of these practices which can produce and stimulate altered states of consciousness, which in turn can open doors to demonic influence, are centering prayer, yoga, and also practices like Tai Chi. Now, Tai Chi, Reiki, and anything associated with manipulating Chi or Ki in the martial arts are also problematic for another reason, and that is that the practitioners are specifically opening themselves up to acquiring certain preternatural powers, certain powers of demonic origin. In the case of Reiki, these powers having to do with healing by the laying on of hands. And I might add parenthetically that I personally know an exorcist who in the course of blessing has actually spoken to and cast out a demon involved in this healing of laying on hands. In the case of Tai Chi or Qi Kung, or anything associated with nipping Qi or Qi in the martial arts, these powers have to do with channeling an occult form of energy which is not of human origin. One example will have to suffice. Quote, In the award-winning, nationally televised 1993 PBS series, Healing and the Mind, host Bill Moyers discussed the popularity of the martial arts and the amazing powers they offer. In one segment, both Myers and martial arts students were astounded as a 90-year-old Tai Chi master used the mystical energy called Qi to send an entire line of students tumbling to the ground by merely throwing Qi at them from a distance of some 20 feet. Interviews with the students afterwards revealed they felt forced down by mysterious and irresistible power. This was the power that they themselves were seeking. Close quote. I've watched this film. It is truly creepy. If you're involved in any of these practices, stop. Stop. The exorcists are working hard enough as it is. If you want to re read more on this, I can recommend this book. It has a foreword written by a really great bishop who's also an exorcist, Bishop Julian Porteous, who's one of the auxiliary bishops of Sydney, Australia. This book is entitled Yoga, Tai Chi and Reiki, A Guide for Christians, and is written by a De La Salle brother, Brother Max Scully. That's Yoga, Tai Chi and Reiki, a guide for Christians written by Brother Max Scully, DLS. So that's the first warning. Because this next topic causes so much consternation, we'll go into slightly more detail. I'll open the second warning by reading an edited excerpt from an article found on LifeSite News. Quote, Toronto, August 23rd, 2007, LifeSiteNews.com. LifeSite News receives angry and often hate-filled responses to its news reports on mainly three subjects. The most hateful and threatening come from San Francisco activists. Second are the angry emails from abortion and population control activists. Third has been the bizarre response to our Harry Potter reports. Every time LifeSite News publishes an article with an alternative view that is critical of the Harry Potter series, we get a flurry of angry and sometimes downright hateful emails from Harry Potter devotees. Close quote. Now that's pretty amazing. The greatest number of angry and hate-filled responses from San Francisco activists, pro-abortion activists, and Harry Potter fans. Obviously this topic stirs up some emotions. Let's just quickly consider a few problems with Harry Potter. This would obviously pertain to Twilight and similar things. We'll start with a few insightful comments from the Catholic author and artist, a man who writes icons, Michael O'Brien. Quote, The most obvious problem, of course, is the author's use of the symbol world of the occult as their primary metaphor, and occultic activities as the dramatic engine of these plots. It presents these to the child reader through attractive role models, such as Harry and Hermione, who are students of witchcraft and sorcery. This has the potential of lowering a child's guard both subconscious and spiritual, 
to actual occult activity, which is everywhere and growing. Rationally, children know that the fantasy element in the books is not real. But emotionally and subconsciously, the young reader absorbs it as real. This is further complicated by the fact that in the world around us, there are many opportunities for young people to enter the cult subcultures where some of Harry Potter's, Harry's powers are indeed offered as real. It is important to note that children read fiction with a different consciousness than adults. This is something that has been overlooked by those Christian leaders who have written pro-Potter commentaries. They forget that children are in a state of formation, that their understanding of reality is being forged at every turn. Wholesome fantasy, regardless of how widely imaginative it may be, reinforces the moral order of the universe in a child's mind. Corrupt fantasy undermines it. The Potter world is corrupt fantasy with a little cosmetics. The cosmetics are the values woven into the tale by the author. Close quotes, Michael O'Brien. Now, I can't recommend Michael O'Brien's insights highly enough. They're easy to find. Just go to LifeSite News and search for Harry Potter. It's a treasure trove of information, LifeSite News. Okay, now let's turn to the men of the church. We'll start at the top. Cardinal Ratzinger. In 2003, Cardinal Ratzinger received a manuscript of a book critical of Harry Potter from a German author. In a letter to the author, he stated, quote, It is good that you enlighten people about Harry Potter because those are subtle subductions which act unnoticed by this deeply distorted Christianity in his soul before it can grow properly. Close quote, Cardinal Ratzinger. It is good that you enlighten people about Harry Potter because these are subtle subductions which act unnoticed and by this deeply distorted Christianity in the soul before it can grow properly. Now let's turn to the men who actually engage in combat with the devil, the exorcists. Mexico. Father Pedro Mendoza, the leading exorcist of the Archdiocese of Mexico City, said the popular Harry Potter book and film series could allow the devil to enter children's minds and does a lot of damage. If you put all these ideas in a child's head, that he can become a wizard, the child believes that, and that is opening an avenue through which the devil can get in, Mendoza said as the series' final book went on sale. Rome. Father Gabriel Amorth, formerly the chief exorcist of Rome, and with 50,000-some exorcisms, the most experienced exorcist in the world, has stated, quote, you start off with Harry Potter, who comes across as a likable wizard, but you end up with the devil. There is no doubt that the signature of the Prince of Darkness is clearly within these books. Close quote. The exorcists also criticized the disordered morality presented in Rowling's works, noting that they suggest that rules can be contravened and lying is justified when they work to one's benefit. The Vatican's former chief exorcist also says, quote, Practicing yoga is satanic. It leads to evil, just like reading Harry Potter. Close quote. One more exorcist story. I was personally present at a conference in which a speaker made some positive remarks about Harry Potter. Another priest who lives in the Caribbean, and at that time had 17 years as an exorcist, immediately jumped up slammed his fist on the table and spoke out in a very low, loud and forceful tone. I mean, I took notes. Harry Potter is pure wickedness. I'm sick of hearing about Harry Potter. It's a gateway to the occult. I'm pretty big. Well, that's, that's for sure. He, he, he could play pro ball. A great big guy, maybe about 300 pounds. I'm pretty big. Another priest and I were sitting on a couch and a teenage boy maybe 115 pounds, picked the couch up and held it up by one leg. I speak to him in English. He answers in English. I speak to him in Latin. He answers in Latin. I speak to him in Italian. He answers in Italian. I speak to him in Spanish. He answers in Spanish. I speak to him in German. He answers in German. When I was exercising him, I asked where all this came from. The demon said, Harry Potter. 
I had four cases in one day of people with demonic problems as a result of involvement in Harry Potter. I don't want to hear anything about Harry Potter. Not everyone gets possessed, but watch out. It was an impressive intervention. Okay, so maybe some folks don't want to listen to the pro-life media comments. Maybe some folks aren't much moved by the comments of an author and religious artist. Maybe some folks can find some way to weasel around the words of Cardinal Ratzinger. But if we're not going to listen to the psalm warnings of the exorcists, the guys that actually fight the devil, exorcists from Mexico, Rome, the Caribbean, well, then all I can say is that pride goeth before the fall. Let's close by considering a powerful way to protect ourselves and our families from the attacks of the devils, something that is often overlooked or unknown, and that is adjuration. What is an adjuration? An adjuration is a solemn demand made in the name of God to do something or to desist from doing something. Okay, an adjuration is a solemn demand made in the name of God to do something or desist from doing something, okay? In regards to devils, the Catholic Encyclopedia points out that, quote, the name of God reverently invoked carries with it an efficacy which demons are unable to withstand, close quote. But are we allowed to adjure demons? St. Thomas states, quote, It is lawful to adjure the demons. We may repulse the demons as being our enemies by adjuring them through the power of God's name, lest they do us harm of soul or body. Close quote. So we are allowed to adjure demons. One easy way of doing just that is by means of what is commonly called a binding prayer. Binding prayer is simply a common name for adjuration. Here is an example of a binding prayer. In the name of Jesus, that's the critical part. That's why it's an adjuration. In the name of Jesus, I bind you, spirit of blank. We'll explain that blank in a second, okay? In the name of Jesus, I bind you, spirit of blank, and send you to the foot of the cross to be judged by our Lord, okay? In the name of Jesus, I bind you, spirit of blank, and send you to the foot of the cross to be judged by the Lord. Again, in the name of Jesus, I bind you, spirit of blank, and send you to the foot of the cross to be judged by our Lord. Now it is blank. That's where we insert the description of whatever's pestering us. Things like lust, panic, anger, fear, whatever is bothering us or tempting us, okay? If this is being caused by a demon, we can tell right away just by saying this a few times, since that's going to stop it. One of my friends told me about how one of his little kids had been waking him up something like 14 times a night or so. Then he said this prayer before he went to bed. In the name of Jesus, I bind you, any spirit that interferes with sleep in any way, and send you to the foot of the cross to be judged by our Lord. And then the kid only woke him up once. The next night he said the prayer again, same thing, and so on. See, he stopped the demons from waking that child up. Now, we don't do this for the whole universe, okay? Just what's bothering us or immediate vicinity or someone specific that we're praying for. Now, they don't have to be near us might be a child in college or someone on the other side of the world, okay? So they don't have to be proximate to us. If we just want to clear the air and don't have a specific thing we've noticed, here's the approach to use. In the name of Jesus, I bind any spirit here that is not of the Holy Spirit and send you to the foot of the cross to be judged by our Lord. In the name of Jesus, I bind any spirit here that is not of the Holy Spirit and send you to the foot of the cross to be judged by our Lord. In the name of Jesus, I bind any spirit here that is not of the Holy Spirit and send you to for the cross to be judged by our Lord, okay? So we can be specific and name a temptation or problem. In the name of Jesus, I bind you spirit of blank, and send you for the cross to be judged by our Lord. Or we can clear the air with, in the name of Jesus, I bind any spirit here that's not the Holy Spirit, and send you to for the cross to be judged by our Lord. For specific temptation or problem, in the name of Jesus, I bind you spirit of blank, and send you to the for the cross to be judged by our Lord. Or we can clear the air by saying, in the name of Jesus, I bind any spirit here that is not of the Holy Spirit and send you to the foot of the cross to be judged by our Lord. Of course, we can also say something like, precious blood, wash over me. Protect me from the wickedness and snares of the devil. Let's close. On this great feast of Epiphany, as we ponder the calling of the Magi out of the darkness of pagan superstition to the sanctification at the crib of the little Lord Jesus, let's thank God 
for mercifully calling our pagan ancestors to the bosom of Holy Mother Church. Let's thank God for mercifully granting us the gift of the true faith and for mercifully keeping us free from or freeing us from superstitious practices. And let's beg him during this holy season of the Epiphany to call our pagan contemporaries, friends, and relatives out of their bondage to the devil and into the freedom of the sons of God.